Welcome to the Mentors by Design podcast. In this show, Fine Design CEO Victor Kostrup brings ideas and inspiration through thought-provoking conversations with entrepreneurs and experts. Whether you're just getting started on your journey or are a seasoned business owner, this show is designed to give you insight into what it takes to succeed. Here's your host, Victor Kostrup. Hey guys, Victor here, and it's another episode of Mentors by Design. It's a very special episode today with Jamie, who is my special guest, who is a professional coach, mentor, and I'm sure you will be amazed just like me. And I'll tell you why. I met a lot of people, met a lot of coaches, and I work with some of the mentors myself. I'm a mentor myself as well. And what I'm amazed about Jamie by his story, when I heard first, and you will be hearing today as well, when I heard first, I said to myself, it's something is not normal with this person, because if I was in his shoes, I would be probably very, very bitter. I would be probably very, very angry at the whole world, at God, at people, because there is a lot of people to blame. And all it starts was as we were sitting and having like regular conversation and Jamie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, you know, as we sitting at the restaurant and I'm thinking that uh, since you are a resident in Las Vegas, you, you and your family, that's where you're from. And I ask, is that's where you're from? <laughs> and Jamie said, well, Victor, this is like my 30th place that I moved to. <laughs> and I kind of like, can you repeat that? I never heard 30th. I thought, well, maybe you you have like special uh, career, but then, or your parents, and then you, you just, with the story I was. Uh, so to begin, let's introduce Jamie and to hear your story. I just want to say, Jamie, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate being here and share your story. Oh, absolutely. And thank you, Victor, for, for having me. You know, just knowing you, I know how much of a, a mentor you can be. And trust me, I am absolutely humbled by even speaking on, on your show. So yeah, I this is my 30th move. I've been in this house for over 20 years. And my move here was number 30. I was born in Los Angeles. And my parents were both Japanese and they moved out to California, had me as a child. They did not, did not speak any Japanese to me growing up. They only spoke in broken English. And my father and my mother, they got divorced when I was around two years old. So I don't remember much before then. My Obviously. father was the son of a pretty wealthy Japanese man, my grandfather. And he spent a lot of his time being president and CEOs of multiple companies, although he never really worked a day in his life, nor did he make money. <laughs> <laughs> That's and interesting. During this time, which was what, what I learned when I grew up, was that he was never a legal citizen. He was at one point, but uh, he was an illegal alien. And part of the reason why we moved around so much was because he was, I believe, running from place to place, from, I guess, career starting to career starting. He really was not a good person to have a business with, let's just say. He did not know how to handle his money. He didn't really seem to understand what efforts people put into me for him and for the belief and the direction that they all thought they were going. And so when they finally made a profit, my father would spend it right away. And of course, they would find out and get very upset and angry. And this was part of one of the reasons why we moved around so much. The other reason was because he was not a very good father. We got into trouble a lot with social services, children, what is it, Children's Protection Agency or something like that. And so 
a lot of times I ended up in youth homes and foster care. So uh, how has it happened first time or second time that you ended up being in somebody else's house and all of a sudden you don't see father around anymore? You know, when it started happening, I don't think I was even old enough to understand what happened. I do remember a lot of arguing between my older sister and my father and being in a little apartment, somebody calling the police on us. Then they come and, you know, I was kind of just the witness or the person stuck in between everything. And, uh, and yeah, the police would get us in a car. We'd talk to a social worker. And we'd end up in, in foster care or youth home. And so being in foster cares, how mm -hmm. many foster cares have you been to? And what do you remember being, because foster care, as I understand, that's uh, another family takes care of uh, you and your sister, right? Is that how it is? That is correct. Boy, I'd say about three foster homes and two youth homes. A youth home is a public facility. That's takes, not, not a lot of fun um, that, to be that, probably uh, in those youth, youth uh, facilities. Correct. The youth homes that I ended up in was in Pontiac, Michigan. Very, very bad place to be. These are children of people that were being accused of drug dealing or prostitution. You name it, they were the children of these people. And, you know, that's where a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, that must have been a horrible experience. And right. That's exactly think, what we think. <laughs> yeah. And I think this is where it really starts for me is these experiences from a young age, I've known subconsciously that I get to choose how I think of an experience. So for example, in the youth home, we would have green light, yellow light, red light. If you were good all day and helped out and was participating and positive, you would have green light. And if mm. at nighttime, if you stayed green, you got to stay up later than all the other kids and you got to have ice cream, like an ice cream sandwich at the end right. of the day. And I thought this was the best thing ever. I was like, oh my gosh, green light, here we go. Meanwhile, the kid that was sleeping next to me, he, I remember walking to the room and seeing this broken glass and then seeing blood all over the floor. And I followed the blood and I see him walking with an adult and his hand bleeding. When he came back with his hand wrapped up, I said, you know, what, what happened? And he said, well, I was so mad that my parents didn't come visit me that I, I punched the, the glass. Mm -hmm. And I just looked at the glass. And, wow. You know, the, somebody that's right next to me that I'm friends with has a totally different perspective on, on everything. Right. You know, my, my father didn't come visit me either in that, at that time he was, he might've been jailed or caught up with lawyers or who knows, but I didn't view it that way. I only saw what I, the tools and the things around me is what I had. So I made use of what I had, but I didn't really pay attention to what I didn't have. So even this is, this is very an experience because first you're saying, I thought about how I think of experience. The, in, in other words, the meaning, I control the meaning. I control the meaning. So the, there is obstacles that I cannot control, but I can control the meaning. That's what you're saying, right? Yes, I can. At a young age, I was able to control my state of mind. Right. So it, this is relates to us on a daily basis. That's we going through daily all the time. We have, yeah, we have a freedom to choose the meaning that I will give to different situation in my life. So, but first you, you have your parents and you have your parent, which who I am assuming same as your friend, your father probably promised you, Hey son, I'm coming back soon. And then uh, based on that commitment, you build your expectations as everybody else does. And uh, what happened when that expectation, it doesn't mean with reality. Do you just feel discouraged? Do you feel angry? Or you just focus on that motivation of green light. If I focus on uh, achieving this praise from people who's giving me the praise, mm -hmm. I'll get the ice cream. How is it? Well, it's funny you ask that. Let's go back to my father's promise. So my father had a very interesting habit of telling people, 
hey, can you watch my children? I'll be back in a couple days. And <laughs> wouldn't come back for a few months. That's Sometimes a even, great parenting. I believe he even left for a, yeah, I believe wow. he even left for about a year one time. And so I still, of course, there's that feeling of abandonment, right. something that I definitely struggled with for a long time. And also, you, you never take a promise quite that seriously. That being said, when I make a promise, I definitely try my best to follow through. And if I don't, I always acknowledge that I could not follow through and that there's improvements to be made and, you know, please don't lose your trust in me type of thing. Because I learned how to view things from multiple points of view, you know, if here's, here's an, a good instance, and, and I'm going to use this one instance and I'm going to transform it into my father. I was in Argentina. In Argentina, they have a lot of stray dogs. And a lot of these stray dogs are very friendly. Mm -hmm. So any dog that would come up to you, they'd be super nice and super friendly. And I'd pet them. Well, stupid me walks up to a dog that's sleeping, a, a German shepherd out of all dogs. Oh, wow. And I said, hello, puppy. And he woke <laughs> up and bit me in the leg immediately. Uh -huh. And most people would probably get mad at the dog. And I immediately said, oh, stupid. I, what stupid kind of person me. am I? What yeah. a stupid move. Right. And so, you know, that reaction, you have to put yourself immediately in the other pair of shoes or other paws in this case. And so when my father disappeared and he would come back, first of all, I was just happy that he came back. <laughs> my sister was very bitter. Mm -hmm. very bitter that he had abandoned us for so long me i only and saw failed, the father failed oh. on the commitment failed on the promise correct lost yes. the trust and so but here's the thing is why did he do that what necessity did he have to have to leave for such a long time and come back you know and and a lot of this had never been answered for me except for one time and that's when he came back and said yeah, I left because I have cancer and I was trying to deal with it without showing my son a weak father. And this is where everything started to rewind for me. And I started to notice, you know, there are underlying things that I never knew about as a child that when he left, he left out of necessity. When he did not come back, he did not come back out of necessity. And this is the way I choose to think of it because I don't have any evidence or hard evidence of why he never came back when he promised to. But this is something that you have to constantly work on is to always know there's, there's three sides to a story, right? Mm -hmm. Your side, their side, and what people see from the outside. That's uh, interesting. And because I have a lot of these concrete examples in my life I've really it was very easy for me to become a coach and a mentor because I was constantly questioning my own situations growing up I never was mad I didn't I didn't react to things I acted on them, but I never reacted to them so if somebody pinched me I'd say why'd you do that instead of slapping them back Right? right, right. It was just instant for me. Like, what was behind the thought of what you just did <laughs> is what would go through my mm -hmm. head. And those kind of question approaches to situations is probably one of the most powerful coaching and mentoring tools anyone could have. And then when I started being trained as a coach, I started to notice that people have formulas for these things. You can write it down and it's, it's concrete. But until then, I never knew it was a technique. Right. It happened to you a lot of it naturally and with the wisdom that you had during that time. And it's, it's amazing. That's why I'm saying, guys, that when I listen to J. Tom's story, I'm amazed. And, and I think that that is why I turn to you, even when I um, dealing with my teenager son, I have three sons and the two of them still teenagers. And uh, like I mentioned to you before, David, he is in about uh, working to you know, open new business. He's a startup 
And then uh, I shared with you a few challenges that I have with David. And uh, immediately you kind of like sense the situation. I was just amazed how you do that. And you sense the situation <laughs> and you said, Victor, you really cannot talk to him like father talks to son. You really have to respect him kind of like a partner and talk on the same level. And then this, is, and you said, this is how I would say, and the way you, you just mentioned that, I thought, is this nothing, nothing is difficult. It's like, it's like, I'm thinking, I know that, but why would I not come out that myself? So uh, this is how you are <laughs> real to me. And this is how real relates to every situation is life is your teacher is life is your teacher. And uh, instead of getting angry, you always observe how to get what, why people act certain way is like, I'm, I'm trying to imagine myself being next to you. As, as you're a child and you're staying in this room and you're waiting for the ice cream and you just observe and you think, well, and there's probably a good reason why my father failed on the, on the promise. Yes. And then yeah, I was a quiet kid. Yeah, quiet, <laughs> quiet, yeah. quiet kid quiet doesn't kid. mean that you are like that you are shy. It means that you are thinker. You are thinking yes. a lot. <laughs> that, that's what happened to you. But now you're not that quiet anymore. You do speak a lot, actually, which <laughs> I, I do appreciate, which I do appreciate because I think, Jamie, you do have to speak. You have so much to tell. And I'm so glad that you are <laughs> on my program today because a lot of people have to hear you. Mentorship is becoming more and more popular every day. And as that happens, more people are realizing that it's simply effective means of growth that is beneficial for both the mentee and the mentor. Yeah. But unfortunately, mentoring, isn't it so pervasive that everyone knows how to make sure a mentoring relationship is a success? And that's what we are talking. So I want to ask you, what are common mistakes that could lead to mentorship relationship to fail in your opinion? Well, first of all, failure is one of the best things that can happen to you or anyone at that. If you do not learn, learn from your failures, that is a true failure. If you do learn from your failure, that is its, its pricing gold is what that is. But there is a big difference between coaching and mentoring. And wow. in my opinion, when it comes to mentoring, experience is one of the key factors that you're going to see when it comes to successful mentors and somebody trying to be a mentor. So mm -hmm. I would say be very careful when you choose your mentor. If that person is not, you think is a good mentor, but turns out not to be, then I would make that person a coach and not a mentor. Mentors, they need experience in the same exact field that you are in. They need to have a lot of failures. So a mentor isn't just a successful person. A mentor is somebody that has fallen on their face many times. If it's somebody that sailed under a lucky star, got super lucky and just nailed it on their first time, never had a single problem, that cannot be a mentor. No way. I see. So how important setting clear expectation from the beginning, would you say? This is important, but you have to always make sure that there's a very large goal and simultaneously you need to always make sure that there is a lot of little tiny goals. For instance, when I do weight loss coaching, mm. I ask them, what is your end goal? I want to lose 50 pounds. Okay, fantastic. How are you going to lose 50 pounds? I'm going to exercise and I'm going to eat well and I'm going to wake up every day at 5 a.m. And I will tell them, is that it? And they would say yes. And then I'd be like, okay, get out. Uh, well, why? Well, because <laughs> those larger goals are not attainable when you just say that. But if I say, how many sodas do you drink a day? And they go, oh, I drink 12 sodas a day. I go, okay, tomorrow, can you make it 11 instead of 12? They said, yeah. I go, now we're talking. Now we're on our way to losing 50 pounds. But you're not asking instead of 12, go down to two or one, right? You, are, you, you go very realistic. Just, Correct. just keep one. Correct. And as you start this momentum, then you can start asking for larger and larger things because they have more confidence. Right. You, um, build, you, you build the confidence first. Correct. 
but right. you still you still as a in the role of coach or mentor so mentoring would be really i would say if i had been overweight once and i lost a lot of that weight and i had a lot of troubles i went through a few diets and then i said then i became you know super fit then somebody approaches me hey how did you do that mm -hmm. then i really believe i could be a true mentor at something like that i see i see that's interesting so about setting the goals it would be also very important to help person to help to set up the goals asking those questions what is your goal and stuff like that right yes and these are going through a lot of levels so let's say there's a goal let's take that that larger goal that's the outer skin but while you do these things you also want to keep track of their men, their mental state their confidence their way of thinking, their ideas. There is so many th things that a coach, a good coach will keep track of spontaneously. And that's how they'll know the health of, of the coach or uh, the coachee and how much they can ask from that coachee. Right, right. No, that's, that's helpful. We're about to finish our episode and I, and I just hope you could share or answer one more question that a lot of people send me those questions in advance and I want to read to you. What would, what would you tell someone who is messed up and don't know how to bounce? I wouldn't tell them anything. And that's part of a key thing is that you really want to ask them and let them coach themselves. Hmm. So explain that. Please. In, sure. So first you want to say, okay, what now there's two ways of coaching. There is a solution future focused coaching, and that's where you don't even mention a problem. Depending on the situation, if you really have to mention a problem or a failure, then you really want to do kind of what's called failure coaching. And failure coaching is when you analyze a failure and you really turn it into something powerful. And you have to convey to your coachee that what they have failed in is going to be one of the best things that's ever happened to them. And to do so, you question you know, what went wrong. In your case, what went wrong? So you basically, first, you try to give them some hope to so they could look at positive on the same situation so they don't like this person. If the person says, oh, no, there is no way I can bounce back, that needs to be changed perspective of that, right? Correct. So, you know, you've got these entrepreneurs that have lost billions and have owed billions of dollars to people and companies and banks and they think nothing of that that's <laughs> this one failure that they could care less about and it's not because they don't feel anything but it's because they have a different kind of mentality and so you know as a coach or a mentor you have to know that there are people out there that have done these things and you say so what what's the big deal well what do you mean what's the big deal you tell me what's not the big deal why right. is this not such a big deal? You think it is, but you tell me. So I do this thing where if somebody can't answer me, I say, what do you think I would say? And they just pause. You know, why, why is this not a big deal to someone? Who would think this isn't a big deal? And they go, I don't know who. I go, well, then tell me. Or who do you think I would say? Or go look it up. And because there's always a bigger problem, right? There's always somebody worse off than, than your situation. There's always bigger failures out there. And if you don't learn from that failure, then it truly is a failure. And you have to get people into the mentality of, oh, something went wrong. This is my time to nail it down, stop it in its tracks, or learn everything I possibly can out of it. That's when you start welcoming failure. Wow, that's, that's good. When you start that's wel good. Welcoming. That's good. Right. So a lot of times when I'm coaching, business coaching, I always present this first. Or, or I present it before a failure happens. That way, when the failure is happening, they're on a different mindset or state of mind. And that state of mind is going to be elevated because they're looking and they're seeing the problem in different light. They're seeing the problem from different sources. They're seeing the problem from different angles. And they will, in turn, analyze the whole situation 
usually they can come out of it better. But if it's something that they just can't do anything about, they're going to learn everything they can from it and accept it much quicker. And if you can accept something like that quicker, you're going to recover from it more, much faster. So that's, that's a good so advice. The, yeah. So failure coaching and fear coaching are two things that I really like to embed into business coaching and mentorship so that if and when it does happen, they welcome it. And I'm sure, Victor, you have some kind of story like this where a total disaster happened, you learn from it, and hopefully it won't happen again. Or if it does happen again, you're probably going to handle it in a different situation. Well, Jamie, I think with you, definitely the foundation, your father laid the foundation when you were as, as a child. Even when you just sharing this wisdom with us right now, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, is there's anything could scare this guy. And I'm thinking, <laughs> probably <laughs> not, because you always go back to that day, that year. Father brings you to this youth center. Guys, imagine this. You're like under 10, maybe 10 years old, and your father, who doesn't have much trust because he's already been taking you to different places, leaving you and saying, I'll come back, but then come back not in two days, but two months, but maybe even three months and so on, and brings you to the youth center. And it's a scary place in Michigan. You can just scare us. The kids running around, bullying and stuff like that. And father says, hey, son, I stay here. I should be back. <laughs> I should be back. <laughs> it doesn't come back for a year. What could be scarier than that? So that's why, I mean, I think you're, you have no fear. You're fearless. <laughs> and at the same yeah, time, you, I just yeah. love how positive yeah. you are. I just love how positive you are. And we're going to invite you more to our show because I want to ask you so many questions. But for today, we are out of the time. And I want to remind everybody else, everybody is, we are part of the Mission Matters. You can find us on missionmatters.com. And there's so much you can hear and find out more. And you can also, there will be more information about JTAM. We're going to list all of the information, how you can get in contact with this amazing coach and mentor. And I'm sure the next time you need some advice, you can reach him directly, right, Jamie? They can do that. Yeah. Uh, so that's yes, great. Absolutely. And thank you again, Jamie, and we'll be in touch. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Victor. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Mentors by Design podcast. This show is sponsored by Fine Designs. Learn more about how Fine Designs can supply apparel for your events at finedesigns.com.